Hello, hello. Oh, there it is. Good morning. All right, well, since we're finally just barely getting you accustomed to two services, we wanted to just keep it exciting that on Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, we're going to do one service at 10. Ha ha! That's it. Just those days. Um, no, I'm, I'm excited that Sunday, that Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve fall on Sundays this year. So we'll have our, our morning, we'll have a special big family service both of those days. Um, but then we're back to 9 and, and 11.30, so don't be confused, all right? Um, you guys, this morning was so special. If you got to, if you came a little early and got to participate, um, we had 26 people get baptized. 26 people. It was incredible. So incredible. It just felt like holy ground. It just felt like holy ground watching people. Um, some of you in this room. Um, so beautiful and special just to get to bear witness and stand with you in, in such a holy moment. And so, um, yeah, really beautiful. All right. Well, you guys ready to jump into the word this morning? Five of you. Okay. The rest of you ready to get into the word this morning? Okay. All right. Um, if you have your Bibles, we are going to spend all morning in Psalm 139, one of my favorites. Um, if you want to turn there, we'll have verses for you on the screen as well. Um, but God's just all week was just putting this in my spirit over and over for us. Um, that he wanted to minister to us out of Psalm 139. And so we're going to dig into the whole chapter this morning, all right? So we're going we're gonna to start at the beginning. Um, Psalm 139, verse 1. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You're familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. I love this, and um, we're going to pause there for a moment, but I love Psalm 139. I love these first six verses and how much we see here the truth and the reality that God knows you. God knows you. Not like kind of knows you, like God really knows you. Everything about you. Um, I love these first six, in these first six verses, you see um, eight different Hebrew words that stack up to tell you in different ways how God intimately is familiar with you. You've searched me, you know me, you perceive, you discern, you're familiar, you hem me in, you lay your hand on me, such knowledge. These words paint a picture of this master detective who just knows every detail about you. Not in a weird, creepy way, in a deeply loving and familiar and safe way. God knows everything about you. Um, he's totally familiar with all your habits, your thoughts, everything about you. He, I love what it says. He knows when you sit and when you stand up, which is kind of funny because it's like, that's like so random, right? Like, God, you're really counting how many times I sit down and stand up. It's like your, your smart, you know, phone device that's like, you should stand. You have been sitting too long, you know? God is aware of even your tiniest movements throughout the day. What does that tell us, right? Like if God is aware of things that we think are totally insignificant and he's paying attention to that, how much more is God aware and paying attention and carefully watching the things that are significant to you, right? If God knows how many hairs are on your head, how much more does God care about the things that are stressing you out, the things that are painful for you? or the things that excite you, your, the dreams in your heart. God is so aware of you. He knows you. He knows when you sit and you stand. It says he perceives your thoughts from afar. Can we put the verse back up? He per perceives your thoughts from afar. Right, so even um, before you can put words to what you're thinking, he already knows and understands what you're thinking. 
I don't know about you, but sometimes I get so frustrated as a person who really values words. Like I get so frustrated when I feel too tired or overwhelmed to put into words what I'm feeling. And I'm just like, bah, you know, and you just don't know how to get it out, but you're just like all of this and I don't even know how to put it into words. God is aware. He can perceive your thoughts from afar. Another translation says he discerns, he understands your thoughts even when you don't. When you have brain fog and you feel it all feels crazy and it just feels like, I don't even know, it's crazy. God sees clearly what's going on inside of you. That's helpful, right? God perceives your thoughts from afar. Nothing's hidden from him. Um, It says he knows you're coming and you're going, right? He knows your schedule. He knows your habits, your behaviors, your activities, your hobbies. He is familiar with all of your ways. Before you speak, he already knows what you're going to say. And, and when you do speak, he knows the intentions behind what you're, gonna, what you're saying, right? He's so familiar with us. I love in verse 5, it says, You hem me in behind and before you lay your hand upon me. You know, the, the Hebrew word there used for hem me in means to besiege. You fully encircle letting nothing else pass through you. You fully surround, fully encircle me. That means he's behind you and he's before you. He's in your past, he's in your future. He knows what's behind you and he's around you and protecting you from your past. He knows what's in your future and he's around you and protecting you. He's everywhere in your past and your future and he lays his hand upon you and he's in your present. And, you know, that's a picture. Uh, David, the psalmist, is giving us a picture of of God who lays his hand upon you. You know, in, in Jewish tradition, the father lays his hand on the son, and he speaks blessing. And he talks to him about his identity, and he speaks to his place in the family, and he, he calls forth his purpose and his destiny. God places his hand on you and calls forth, calls forth your purpose, your destiny, he speaks over your identity. God favors you. God blesses you. Do we believe that? Do we believe that we're favored by God? That we're chosen by God? That we're walking in his blessings? So God knows your heart, your fears, your thoughts, your motives, your dreams, your frustrations, right? He's in your past, your present, your future. He understands you. He understands you better than you understand yourself. And that should give us a lot of hope, right? Because if God knows your past and your future more than you do, who better to turn to when you're making decisions about your future? He knows what's ahead. So if we really believe this, that God really knows our past and our future, and God is, knows me better than I know myself, he should be the first one I would want to run to for direction in my life rather than what everybody else is doing, rather than what my industry says, rather than what my parents say, rather than what my friends say, rather than what culture says, running to God who knows me best. God, what do you have for me? God, what is best for me? He's the safest one to run to for clarity, for decisions, for everything. And it also gives us a lot of peace knowing, wow, God, you know me. The good, the bad, the ugly, and you still love me. If we, when we understand that, there's no more feeling like I need to hide from God or pretend to be something I'm not. Here's me, perfect Christian, right? I can be real with God because he already knows. And he, he, in, in all of the knowing of me, he's still so in love, Right? God knows you. As we continue on in Psalm 139, we see that God pursues us. Verse 7, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you're there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. 
I love this whole next you know, section of this, of this chapter because it reminds us that not only is God everywhere, but God is pursuing you everywhere all the time. No matter where you're at, no matter if you are thriving in your relationship with God, if you're on a mountaintop, or if you're in the worst place you've ever been, making the worst decisions you've ever made, it doesn't matter where you are or what you're doing or where you find yourself, God himself is pursuing you. He's chasing you down with his love. You cannot escape it. You cannot stop it. He is so in love with you. He will find you anywhere. There's no place you can go that's too far. There's no no pain you can fall in that's too deep that God cannot find you and pull you out of. This is good news. He is a God who pursues us constantly. You know, in this passage, there's two words you see pop up, where and if. Where, 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 if, if, if. So often, these are two things we're constantly saying to God. Where are you, God? Where should I go? Where is my provision? Where's my husband? Like, where, God? Where, where, where? And then if. What if, God? But what if? What if I do that and you don't come through? What if? What if? What if? What if? And on the other side of every where and what if, you see he's there. He'll pursue you there. No matter the scenario, he will be there. He will be there. You know, I have a, um, a bad habit that I am, I am trying to break in my life. Um, catastrophizing. So fun. <laughs> Anybody else ever like, what's the worst case scenario that could ever happen? And you like play it out in your head and like, and everybody's dead, you know? And like, it just... You're like, wow, wow, that really escalated unnecessarily. Um, So here's the thing, and and something that's helped me manage that when it's popped up. And I start thinking about the worst thing I could think happened to my child or to, you know, whatever. You just start, oh my God, I would would just die a thousand times. You know, you just start like thinking about all the awful things. And then God began to speak to me and was like, listen, you don't in this moment feel grace to walk through that because you're not walking through it. But, heaven forbid, if you were to walk through that, I would be there, and there would be grace. And I can't even get my head around it, but I know it's true, because I've also experienced it. I've walked through things I didn't think I could walk through, and he was there. So the truth is, no matter the scenario, no matter the situation, he's always there. Why? Because God pursues you. And him pursuing you is not dependent on you. (laughs) Thank God. It's not dependent on your good behavior. It's not dependent on, well, God will pursue me if I do ABC. No, God is in love with you, right? While we were still sinners, he died for us. It had nothing to do. It wasn't like we showed him how cute and wonderful we could be. So he's like, fine, I'll go to the cross. No, in our mess, he said, I love you, I see you, I value you. I know who you are, because you're made in my image. God is constantly pursuing us. Why does this matter? Why does knowing this matter? First of all, you're wanted by God. Over and over in the Bible, we see this affirmed. We are called God's beloved, God's chosen. God is so in love with you. He wants relationship with you. He wants to be close to you. He wants you to go through this life with him. He wants to be with you. That should make you feel really good, that the God of the universe desperately wants to be close to you. He's not just satisfied You know, he loves being friends with Hona, but he's not just satisfied being friends with Hona. He wants to be friends with me too, right? Because there's a place only you can fill in his heart. God is so in love with you. And so often in our society, in our culture, we're just crushed under this weight of loneliness. We're crushed under this weight of, does my life even matter? What am I doing? When we have a revelation that God pursues us, 
and, and has great things for us and wants to be close to us, that changes that dynamic. We begin to understand the value that we have. And here's the beautiful thing is God wants to be close to the real version of you, right? Not the made up, perfect, skippity dippity, nice little cleaned up Christian version of you. So often we think we have to go get it all together so that we can come and be close to God, right? And we just think, oh, I'm screwing up, I'm messing up, I'm not, whatever, fill in the blank. And we start kind of separating a little bit from God because we feel ashamed or we feel like we should fix it all. God wants to be in all of it, right? It's in those moments especially where he's pursuing us and he's like, bring me the mess. You don't have to hide this addiction from me. You don't have to hide this struggle from me. You don't have to hide this depression from me, whatever. You don't have to hide it from me. I, let me step into the middle of it. I'm safe. I'm good. I love you. I'm pursuing you no matter where you're at. I want to be close to you. And it frees us. God knows you. God pursues you. And as this passage goes on, we see that God has designed you with purpose. Verse 13, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in the secret place, when I was woven together in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. I love this. It was God who knit you together in your mother's womb. God. It wasn't just science or accident or whatever. It was God who purposefully knit you together in your mother's womb. David said, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. There is n- God, there's no other, ever going to be another version of you. God broke the mold, right? You are fearfully and wonderfully made. This is the truth. This is the reality. You're God's masterpiece. He loves the way he made you. He loves the way you look. He loves your skin tone color. He loves the shape of your body. He loves your exterior. He loves your interior. He loves your personality, the things you think are lame or annoying. He loves that about you. He made you specifically like this. He wired you like this for great purpose, for great intentionality. He doesn't want you to be like somebody else. He made you this way. That's hard for us in our culture when we're all kind of trying to just fit in. And God's like, from the womb, like, be who I made you to be. Right? He, he's purposefully, beautifully designed you with great, he loves your personality. He loves the way you see the world. He, he's, there's so much purpose in how he's made you. There's things only you can do because of how he's wired you. There's certain experiences only you can do because of how he's wired you. There's certain ways you can minister to him that are so unique to you because of how he's wired you. There's certain people only you can win over to God because of how he's wired you. You are a masterpiece. And it doesn't matter what your you know, family of origin story is. It doesn't matter what your conception story is, what you've been told. Oops, you were an accident. Or, you know, whatever your parents thought. It doesn't matter. God himself wove you together in the womb. God himself dreamt you up. God himself had purpose for your life. God himself called forth your life on this earth. God himself filled your mother's womb with his presence, and like a master seamstress knit together thread by thread everything about you with great purpose and detail. God himself has been present in your life since the beginning. Do you realize the first thing you ever were aware of in your existence was the presence of God? 
in the womb. You know, a baby in the womb is in utter darkness, pitch black. The first thing they're aware of is their creator, the presence of God, shaping them, molding them, breathing life into them. You know what always amazes me? That babies dream in the womb. Do you know this? So weird. Babies in the womb, tiny, tiny babies in the womb dream. What are they dreaming about? You've had zero experiences. You've had zero things today to experience. It's pitch black. What are you dreaming about? I I think babies are dreaming about God because they're experiencing God. Even for, you know, if you're like, well, I didn't even know God. You knew him in the womb because he was there knitting you together. Speaking life over you. Dreaming things for your life. You know, the enemy just hates how much God delights in your beauty and uniqueness. I I feel like the enemy's always trying to tear down how we see ourselves because he's such a, he's like the ultimate narcissist and he cannot handle that the attention is not on him, that God is so fascinated with you, that God is so delighted in you. And so he constantly is trying to get us to not see ourselves with the value that we really have in God. You know, in verse 16 there, it says, uh, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Another version says, you saw who you created me to be before I became me. Before you were ever born, God had designed and crafted your days. The boundaries, the opportunities, the things that would come in your life. God has designed with great purpose your life. God has a purpose for your life. It's a beautiful story. It's a beautiful adventure. You've probably heard me say this before. I love to tell the kids that talk about this, but it's like the God who made dinosaurs, right? The God who made all the freaky little creatures at the bottom of the ocean that are so bizarre. That guy did not write a boring story for your life. There's no way. The ultimate creator did not write some, well, I guess I'm just going to survive and then one day die. Like that is not hit what the story that's written for your life. All the days ordained for you were written before one of them came to be. There are days, listen to me, days ordained for you. There are days ordained for you. There are things God has called you to do. That's why we preach here and we talk about not just cultural Christianity, not just check the religious box. No, to truly be surrendered to Jesus and let Jesus be the Lord of your life. We are following Jesus, right? We're following, we're followers of Jesus because we're following the path he has for us. God has things for your life. There's a certain school God wants you to go to. There are certain jobs God God wants you to have because he's building a bigger story. There's certain friendships God wants in your life because he's, there's purpose in it. There's certain opportunities, there's certain things, right, that God is intentionally building in your life. I don't know about you, but I do not want to get to heaven and find out that I only lived in like 20% or 30% of what God had for me. That would be devastating. Just because I wake up and I'm like, it's just Monday, I'm just going to do Monday. And I just do my own thing. It's just Tuesday, I'm going to keep doing what I do on Tuesday. And I'm not even like trying to walk in God's purpose and destiny for my life. I don't want to miss it. And here's the great thing about God. Is if you're like, whoa, I definitely took the controller, you know, the steering wheel, and I've been just doing my life how I want, whatever... I'm not sure I'm really walking in God's destiny for me. You can always just repent, turn, get back on track. It's not like God pulls your destiny away. I used to feel like that. I used to worry if I like did one thing wrong, God's going to be like, sorry, your whole destiny has gone. That's not like that. He's, he's a good God. You can always step back into his, what he has for you. But God has beautiful things planned for you. 
God has dreams for your life. Doesn't matter your age, your stage of life. There are beautiful things God has for you. So from the womb all the way through, God has been um, designing you with purpose and leading you with purpose. And we need this revelation in our life. You know, if we really believed that we are designed with purpose, it would wipe away all of the rejection that we feel. It would wipe away the questions around our worth or our value. It would excite us with the truth that, that our lives matter, that we're not broken, that something's not wrong with us. So often the enemy tries to come in, you're broken, you're messed up, you're, you know, you're a failure. It's just, he's such a liar. The reality is I am made in the image of God. I am perfectly fashioned. I know I'm a little weird. It's how he made me. I have purpose in my life. There's destiny in my life. God knows me. God loves me. God's got beautiful things for me, and he's with me. I'm not alone. God knows you. God pursues you. And God's designed you with great purpose. And then verse 17, we see here that God is attentive to you. God is attentive to you. Verse 17, how precious to me are your thoughts, God. How vast is the sum of them. Were I to count them, they would outnumber the grains of sand. When I awake, I am still with you. I love this. I don't know about you, but have you ever cried out to God? God, do you even care? Do you even see what's happening down here? Am I the only one? Wow, y'all are not dramatic. Okay, good for you. Um, I definitely have my moments where I'm like, God, do you care? Do you see? Where are you? You know, and I'm crying out to God. And here's the truth that it brings me back, grounds me in those moments. God is so attentive to me. He's never turned away. He's never turning his back. He's never turning his face. He's so attentive. He's so present to you, to your needs, to your life. He's so aware. It says more than all of the grains of sand in the world are his thoughts towards you. Now, I don't know these kinds of scientists these days that have this kind of time to do this kind of math, but according to these guys, scientists, um... On the planet, we have about 7.5 sextillion, didn't know that was a number, grains of sand. 7.5, there you go, sextillion is their estimation of how many grains of sand are on earth. This is a seven and a five and 17 zeros. Okay, that's a lot. That's a lot. If God is thinking about you, you, more than that, what does that tell you? His thoughts towards you are more than that. God is very attentive to you. He's always thinking about you. He's always ready. He's always present. He's always near. He's got so much, so many thoughts of love and and affection and compassion and hope and ideas and strategy and, and healing, so much thoughts towards you, always ready. You see, when you understand that you have his attention and his affection, you don't have to act like a child who's needy for attention. You don't have to try to impress him so he'll maybe give you a breakthrough in your life. You don't have to hustle. You don't have to try to perform or, or be the perfect thing you think he wants you to be so maybe he'll, he'll love you. It settles your soul. He is so in love with me. Wow, that's a lot of thoughts. His attention is on me. He's so aware. I don't have to beg and plead and hope and wonder if he's out there. He is so right here, so aware, so intensely invested in me. He's attentive to you. He's always available. He's always leaning in. Next, we see that God defends us. Verse 19 David begins to bring his problems to God, as David typically does. And he says, if only you, God, would slay the wicked. 
Away from me, you who are bloodthirsty. They speak of you with evil intent. Your adversaries misuse your name. Do I not hate those who hate you, Lord, and abhor those who are in rebellion against you? I have nothing but hatred for them. I count them my enemies. You know, David begins to cry out to God about his enemies, and he brings up the things that are troubling him. And at first sight, you might be like, wow, David, that's like a weird addition into this really beautiful psalm. Like, we were really going somewhere, David. And you really took a left turn here, like bloodthirsty, I don't, what, wow, what's going on? But what I love about what this shows us is that because David believed the whole first part of Psalm 139, that God knows him, and God loves him, and God's got purpose for him, and God's attentive to him, and God's pursuing him, he knows that God is a safe place to bring his problems and he knows that God defends him. And so David brings the things that are troubling him because he knows that God is his defender. What does this mean? It means that we don't have to figure out all of our problems by ourselves. So often we feel the weight, I have to fix it, right? Ladies, I'll, I'll, I'm sure maybe some of the guys have said this too, but women, how many of us have ever said, if I don't do it, nobody will? <laughs> All the hands are like. <laughs> so often we live under this weight, I have to fix it. If I don't do it, nobody will. I have to provide, I have to defend, I have to get justice for myself, I have to fill in the blank. And we live under this weight, and the reality is you are not meant to live under that weight. God is your defender. God is your protector. God is your provider. God is your vindication. God is your redeemer. But you see, if you don't believe the whole first part of Psalm 139, you're going to have a hard time believing that he's good to defend you. If you don't believe that he's, he really knows you and loves you and is present and attentive towards you, you're gonna feel like, well, I have to just go figure it out myself. I gotta go fix it myself. I gotta go provide myself. I gotta go, you know, all these things. And we get into actually not trusting God. And the truth is that he is infinitely good and he's your, he's your defender. He's a good father, he's your protector. You know, in one of the earlier passages I forgot to mention, um, <clears throat> I think it was verse, where is it? Um, somewhere in there. It's talking about God's um, hand holding us. I think it was at the beginning. How, you know, David was talking about how um, with, with your hand you, you guide me and your right hand holds me. And it's this picture of God who's guiding you and leading you, but also with his right hand holding you close. He's holding you close. God is a good father. And he is big enough to defend you. Right? He's all around you. Remember, he's, he's encamped around you. He's encircled around you. He's everywhere. He's big enough to defend you. I think so much of the anxiety we live in in our current world is because we don't really believe that. And so we spend so much time and energy stressing about how we're going to take care of ourselves, how we're going to keep our kids safe, how we're going to, to make our business work, how we're going to survive, how we're, we, we put all this weight on ourselves. And it's not, now listen, listen. The other side of that coin, it's not like we're supposed to just be out here like, okay, whatever, I don't need a job, God will provide, I don't, that's, that's, that's not what we're doing here, okay? There's balance, you do your part, right? It's not like you're just out here floating like, oh, God will protect me, I'm gonna sleep on the train tracks, you know, it's, Rue is camping this weekend with another family from the church and they're camping, uh, beach camping right next to these railroad tracks and I was like, stay off the tracks, you know, and I told him, he's like, oh no, mom, we're gonna go lay our sleeping bags on the tracks and sleep, you know, and just being a smart aleck and so I'm not I'm not advising like you know doing dumb things and being like oh God will protect me at the same time there's 
an understanding that it is, I do my part, I walk in wisdom, I seek God, all of that. But at the end of the day, I cannot carry the weight because I, I will never be enough. I will never be enough as a mom to protect my kids. There is just, as noted by all of the broken bones and split open heads they've all had. And I am like a really protective mother and it's never enough, right? It's just the reality. It's the reality. We're, you know, all your hustle will never be enough, but we don't have to live under the weight of that. You have a good father who is your defender, who is your provider, who is your protector, and he wants to do the heavy lifting, but we have to trust him. We have to trust him. And then finally, as as the passage ends, we learn that God transforms us. Verse 23, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. David starts this psalm, you know, at the very beginning with, God, you've searched me and you know me. And now he's at the end and he's saying, search me again, God. Know me again. Search me again, God. Examine me. Look for anything in me that's out of order. Search me, God. Is there anything in me that, that needs alignment, that needs adjusting, that's, that's offensive to you, that's not right? God, will you search me? You know, it's a bold prayer, inviting God to start digging around in your soul. That's a bold prayer. Anybody? I think it's a bold prayer. Get on up in there, Lord. What do you see? Like, that's a bull prayer. And actually, like, I'm willing to do something with whatever you find in there. Like, lead me in the path everlasting. Like, that's a bold prayer. But the reality is, to be able to pray that, to invite God to really transform you, to do that, you have to believe everything we just read in Psalm 139. So often, guys, I don't know about you, but we approach God, we approach life like in the defense, always defending our position. But God, this is why I did what I did. Uh, but this, is, this was my intention. We're constantly like in defense mode to God and the world, trying to explain our motives, trying to explain what we're just constantly, but you don't even know my story, but you don't even know, you know doing the best I can out here. We're, we're constantly kind of in this defense mode. And the reality is we don't have to be with God. First of all, he already knows. He already knows all of it, right? And secondly, when you understand that the invitation of the gospel is to truly transform you, you have nothing to defend. Search me, God. God, I trust you. You're so good. Search me. If there's anything in me that's harmful, that is out of alignment, I surrender it to you. I invite you in. Here is the beautiful thing. You see, religion is just talk. It's just laws. It's just um, pretending in a lot of ways. It's empty. Religion is empty. True relationship with Jesus will transform you. True encounter with Jesus transforms us. The invitation of the gospel is that God can take your anxiety and truly transform it into peace. We don't just sing about it. Oh, I'm so grateful, our first song, for all the miracles you've done. It's not just words out of our mouth. We've experienced it. We've experienced the miracles of God in this church. We've experienced God change pain and sickness into healing and life. Shana up here singing this morning. She's experienced God transform cancer out of her child's body into healing. We're not just, it's not just religious dead works. We're not just talking about, oh God, no. God transforms. God transforms broken marriages. God transforms families. God transforms bodies that need healing and alignment. God transforms our minds, our thoughts, our our mental health, all of who we are. God is constantly 
ready and available to bring life and healing and transformation and an upgrade in your life. This is the invitation of truly encountering Jesus. But the truth is, we are to, to experience the transformation, he's got to be close. Because transformation doesn't just happen because you came to church once. It happens as you walk with him. It happens in relationship with him. It happens as you're close to him, as you're letting him in. But church, if we're going to really let him in, it's scary to let somebody start digging around your soul, to let somebody start speaking to you about your finances or your, how you're managing your relationships or your sexuality or whatever is going on in your life. It is, you don't want anybody getting up in there talking to you, but unless it's this guy, the one who knows you, designed you, loves you, is completely for you, is constantly available to you, always turned towards you, so affectionate, so present, ready to defend you. He knows all the good, the bad, the ugly, and he's still so fascinated with you. He's so close. Yeah, I can let him in. He's safe. He's safe to come in and speak. He's safe. to come in with those deep fears in my life. He's safe to let in. And that's where real transformation happens. But we've got to know him so that we, who he really is, as we see in Psalm 139, so that we can trust him and let him in. And as David prayed, and lead me in the way everlasting. I want to pray for us this morning, church. I want to pray that we would have a fresh revelation, true revelation and encounter with the God who knows us. That this would go so deep in us that it would uproot any rejection, that it would uproot any feelings of inadequacy, anywhere we've kind of kept him at a distant in, distance in certain parts of our life, that we would say, God, you're so good. God, you're beautiful. Wow, I am so loved. There's so much purpose in my life. You've been with me all along. You have good things for me. You know exactly why I am the way I am. I don't have to prove anything or defend myself to you. And you think I'm beautiful. You think I'm incredible. And you're wooing me, you're calling me into this path, into this journey that you have for me that is so incredible. And so I want to pray for us. Would you stand, if you, if you will, this morning, where you're at? Would you maybe just put your hand on your heart. We're just going to pray for ourselves this morning. Jesus, all over this room, I pray for every person in here. I pray, God, for a fresh encounter with a God who knows them. I pray that the revelation of your presence and your love and your affection and your design towards them would go so profoundly deep in them, God, that it would shake off any insecurity, any self-hatred, any rejection, any feelings of, of not liking themselves or not being worthy or whatever. Just shake it all off in Jesus' name. And I pray for truth to flood their hearts right now, every one of us, that we would have a revelation how you've been with us from the womb, how you've designed us, how you love us, how you have so much purpose and destiny for our lives.
And God, I pray. I pray for anybody in the room, Lord, who has not maybe been on the path that you have for them. That is turning, God, that they would turn and get on this beautiful path that you have for them. As we're just in this moment, just with everybody, just with your eyes closed, I, I want to just ask, I just feel stirring by the Holy Spirit. If there's, if there's anybody in here and you're like, yeah, I don't, I don't know that where I'm at with God. I don't know if I'm, I'm right with God and I want to get right with God today. I want to get on his path. I want to give myself to Jesus. I want to surrender to him. I want to follow him. If that's you, just raise your hand. I want to pray with you. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah. Yeah, I see those hands. Okay. Can we all just pray this together, church? Why don't you just repeat after me? Jesus, I give you my whole life. You are the Son of God. And I want to follow you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you for forgiving me. I choose you. I say yes to you. I give you my whole life. I want to walk in the purpose you have for me. And I want to know you intimately. Jesus, we thank you, God. We thank you, Father. I pray for all of us in this room, just a fresh revelation, a fresh encounter with how real, how near, how good, how present, how attentive you are in our lives. I pray that this would just even be a season where we're just so lovesick with you, Jesus, as we have this revelation. We thank you, God. We speak your blessing over every person in this room. Fresh encounter with Jesus. In your name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen, amen.